Um, I'm very glad to get the opportunity to speak to you about different kinds of causality methods. And when I was preparing this talk, I was thinking about what do I think benefits the society, uh, benefits this group of people the most. And I figured, you probably don't want to hear that much about my research, but I think this community needs more of an overview of different causality methods that are directly applicable to you. So just my background, I'm a machine learning causality person. I've worked with geoscience data primarily for the past eight years or so. So my first question is, who knows who these people are? If it's in this, okay, I see a few hands. Great. To bring a few more people on board, maybe I'll give you the names and see who knows these people. Okay. Who knows who Clive Granger is? Who's heard of Granger and has used it somehow? Very few hands. I expected the whole group to be saying, hey, I know Clive Granger. So seriously, most people don't know Clive Granger? Okay. That is the very, very bad. Okay. But then I have even more work to do. Wow. Okay. Who knows who Judy Pearl is? About as many hands. I'm surprised. I would have thought everybody knows Clive Granger and nobody knows Judy Pearl. But it seems like there's a, there's a bunch of people here who don't know either one. So I'm going to speak to you. And those people who already know all these people, I just apologize because this is going to be a very basic talk because I have the feeling that's what the community needs right now. So. There are two primary concepts for causality, for causality that are being used. One is Granger causality, which was developed in 1969 by Granger. And he was an economist, and he was just trying to analyze time series data and try to figure out causal relationships from that. Again, keep in mind, 1969. Right? Um, then there is the concept of Pearl causality, which came much, much later. Uh, he developed this in the late 1980s, and then the big paper that was a big breakthrough came in 1991, and he's written lots of books about causality ever since. So again, there's over 20 years between the two. Um, and I'm now going to talk a little bit about, again, okay, 1969, Granger causality, and that is mainly being based on prediction. And I will tell you in more detail in later slides what that means. While the idea of per causality is more based on intervention studies. And I will tell you more about that too. Um, and also, Pearl doesn't just, didn't just define Pearl causality. He developed this whole framework of um, of causal calculus. And can everybody hear me? Because I don't have an extra microphone. So, if everybody can hear me. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, so. Just in terms of recognition, it's kind of funny because the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2011 went to Sargent and Sims, and Sims basically used the Granger approach for macroeconomics. And in the very same year, Julia Pearl got the Turing Award for his work on Pearl causality, which is pretty much the Nobel Prize in computer science. So same year, recognition for both frameworks. Um, what's the use of those two concepts? So both were used first in economics and social sciences, and that's actually where they were developed early on in the 1960s and 1970s, and then used heavily also in the 1980s and so forth. Uh, per calculus was also used in both of them. Again, was also developed in economics and social sciences first. Recently, you get the most big breakthroughs in bioinformatics, where you have like maybe data for 10,000 different proteins, and you're trying to figure out what are the interactions of these proteins, what interacts with what, or the same as genes, so you have this huge data sets. Yes, Richard. Oh, just a quick comment. Since people in the room haven't heard of Granger, they probably don't know that he also got a Nobel Prize. True, yes. That was a few years earlier. And I don't have that here. That's right. Yes, yes, yes. So, 2003, thank you. So, noted. I need to change that slide in the future. In 2003, Granger got a Nobel Prize. Okay. So recently, you've, you may have heard big breakthroughs in bioinformatics again about rec gene regulatory networks, protein interactions, or finding new connections in the brain that are using either Granger or Pearl causality. So used heavily. If you look in the climate science literature, you find very, very little. You find Granger causality quite a bit for bivariate variables, so mainly two variable relationships. You find some research on using Granger causality more in a, in a larger sense, you find very, very little on using per causality. There are some researchers doing that, but very, very few. So given that a lot of the breakthroughs in bioinformatics came from these areas, and that some of the problems in bioinformatics, especially looking at connections in the brain, 
uh, actually quite similar to looking at, for connections in the atmosphere, uh, I think it's time that we upgrade our toolbox. So I'm trying to do my part today by giving you the basics for how to do that. Okay, so the purpose of this talk is to put known methods, if you already use grain causality, put that in context. How does it relate to uh, pro causality and so forth? And just to make you aware of other frameworks and methods that you can use. And to point out some strengths and limitations because all of these methods have their uh, limitations. None of them are miracle solutions. So this may be my most important slide. What is Granger causality versus per causality? So Granger causality is really defined based on predictability. Basically what Granger asks is, is the value of x important to predict the value of y? So you have your observed data set, you usually do regression, you look at your regression coefficients and you figure out, is x important to predict the value of y? So it's totally based on predictability. And if that is the case, then you may say x Granger causes y. All right? In contrast, per causality is defined on interventions. So Pearl asked, if I intervene in my system and I change the value of x and maybe let some time pass, does that change the value of y? Which is a very different question. Because if I'm wondering, for example, oh, I noticed that, you know, whenever my clock says it's 10 p.m., it's dark outside. Okay, so let's do an experiment. If I take my data and I say, oh, that happens every evening. My clock must be causing it to be dark outside. So I'm going to do an experiment. I'm going to change my clock. Do you think it's going to be bright outside? Of course not. So that's the key difference between uh, the Granger causality principle and the per causality principle. Okay, everybody with me so far? Okay, key difference in definition. So some of you may say, well, that's all good and fine, but in climate science, I can't really do interventions in most cases. If I have a simulation, that's great, but we really can perform interventions in climate science. So what good is the definition based on intervention if I can't use it anyway? And the key answer is, even if you can't do interventions, you still have to build the mathematical framework based on a proper definition. And even if you only have observations, that definition is going to help you to figure out what you can and cannot say. So you have to start with the proper definition. So if you really truly care about causality, you should use Perl's framework in, in many cases. I, I get to some nuanced statements later. If, on the other hand, you only care about prediction, you're perfectly fine with Granger causality. Because if you're not doing interventions anyway, and if you don't really care about model building, you don't care about the causal relationships, you just care about having good predictions, you're perfectly fine to use the Granger causality framework. Okay. All right, so again, the key point is, if you actually wanna, uh, if you actually wanna build a, a proper framework, you have to start with a proper um, intervention definition, and then you can build on that, and there's this whole framework of causal calculus. All right, so um, one term that's important when you deal with, with causality is directed acyclic graphs, which we heard about yesterday, uh, and they are part of a probabilistic graphical model. So I wanted to give you a little bit of vocabulary here. If you hear the stuff that you know what we're actually talking about. So let's just look at this at this graph on the right-hand side. This is just a sample graph. It has five variables, A, B, C, D, E. So in this case, I only cared about five variables. And the variables can be anything in climate science. They can be compound indices. They can represent the value of a field at a specific location. And maybe you, if you want to have a temple model, variables for different lag times. And so your graph is going to encode statistical dependencies. And I'm going to say this very loosely. Those people who know the field very well, this isn't perfectly concise what I'm saying here, but if I want to go through all the masses, kind of, I'm going to lose all, many of you. So very loosely speaking, the idea here is there is an error from x to y if change the state of x would change the state of y in my system. So kind of like causality. Okay? That's what I'm aiming for. That's what, not, not what I would always get, but that's what I'm aiming for. So the true graph, I'm hoping, has these kind of properties. Okay. So, um, we call this over here a direct, oops. We call this over here directed acyclic graph. Directed because 
while each error, each edge has an error head. And it's called IA cyclic because you can't have loops. So for example, I can go from here down to there, but if I follow the error directions, I can never get back to A. Okay, so no loops allowed. In climate science, you usually do have feedback loops. So what do you do? Well, the trick is just to then have separate variables for the original variable and several lagged variables because then it actually becomes different variables in time. And so you can actually deal with feedback loops using that kind of framework. Okay. My key thing is we should all be thinking in terms of graphs like this because they're very powerful and are very concise language and it would be much easier to explain uh, causality in terms of these things. Uh, and just a piece of vocabulary in computer science, if you have graphs like this, if there's an error from x to y, then we call x uh, the parent of y and y is the child of x. Okay. So, we said probabilistic graphical models, so the probabilities have to come in somewhere. So a probabilistic graphical model is basically a graph like this, where in addition I assign a conditional probability to each one of those nodes. And for each node, they only have to condition on its parents. So if you look at A up here, it doesn't have any parents, so you, I would just have P of A. If I look at B, well, it has one parent, so it would be P of B conditioned on A. And D down here, has three parents, so it would be P of D conditioned on A, B, and C. Okay? And the beauty of that is that this is the simplest representation that you can have to represent the whole joint probability. So if I want to know the joint probability of P of A, B, C, D, E, I only have to multiply P of A times P of B given A and so forth. I just multiply the individual probabilities from the different nodes and I get my joint probability. And this encodes the sparsity of the whole system. That's all encoded in that graph. I only need to look at that graph to figure out which variables are related to which ones. Okay. And just again for vocabulary, if you hear Bayesian network, well, if my original graph was directed and I have these conditional probabilities like that, I call it a Bayesian network. And uh, if it's undirected, I have a slightly different structure and I call it a Markov network. And I found out last night that Noel actually has been working with all those things, especially Markov networks, already back in 1998. So, no, keep up the good work, keep spreading graphical models. Um, and then again, here, hidden Markov models are just a special case of dynamic Bayesian networks. And there are lots of other types of networks that you can also describe in terms of those things. All right. So, again, this is a directed acyclic graph if you don't have loops. And now the interesting thing is that if you have a causal model, it's always going to be a minimal model by definition. It has a minimal number of errors, is what I mean by minimal model. It may not be the only one. In fact, there may be several minimal models. There's a whole Markov equivalence class of them, but the causal model is always going to be one of the minimal ones. Which means, this is why we strive for causality. This is why humans strive for causality, because it's the simplest model. It has the smallest conditioning sets. It's simplest to keep in our brain to figure out what matches the observations. And furthermore, that's also why geoscience are so interested in causality, because it's the simplest model for all the explanations. And it's also the simplest model to encode if you have the smallest number of, uh, of members in your conditioning sets. So learning such dependency graphs is actually a task that's been worked on for, since the 1980s very heavily. And it's really computationally feasible these days, and there are lots of different methods to do that. And that's what's given a lot of the breakthrough in bioinformatics is learning these kind of graphs over here from data. Okay, an example. I was so happy to see Matthias' talk yesterday where he actually put up a graph, which is a perfect example of a directed acyclic graph, a DAG. If you assign probabilities here, you have a Bayesian network, which is a probabilistic graphical model. Um, so again, one of the questions he was asking was, well, the conditioning set for each node, which is other parents of the nodes, so for Y3, that's, for example, Y1 and Y2, what should they be? And again, for questions like this, you could do structural learning. It may give you the best result. I wouldn't be surprised if Matthias already found the best result, but uh, we can basically use those methods to confirm that. All right. So there are two types of causality studies. There are, as I mentioned before, intervention studies where the cause analysis involves interventions. In geoscience, you can usually only do that if you have simulations, right? 
Um, so you can add the you can add the inputs or the states in your system. And that is, of course, the strongest tool, and that supports very strong causality conclusions. Turns out, even if you only have observations and you cannot do any interventions, you only have weaker causality conclusions, but they're still very powerful. So I will first briefly talk about intervention analysis, and that isn't my topic at all. I don't do intervention analysis, but I thought this group needs to hear what's in this paper, and it's only 12 pages, and I think it's highly relevant to you guys. And since it builds on Perl, I thought it fits nicely into this talk. So um, the nice thing is that Alexis Hanard, who is a, was a PhD student of Julia Perl, already translated the whole Perl causality framework into causal attribution. So if you care about extreme, um, about attribution of weather and climate-related events, this is the paper to look at. Oh, he was? But he worked with Pearl. Okay. Well, thank you for that correction. Okay. Thank you. He told me that he worked with him during his PhD, and I took that to take that he was a student. Okay. Noted. All right. So, let's say, why is the binary available for an extreme event? Say a heat wave. And I just set my temperature threshold to something, and I say everything. If my temperature goes above that, I call it a heat wave. Let's just not talk about temperature scales right now. Let's just say, okay, that's my... That's my threshold, and I get a binary variable that's zero if the event doesn't occur, and it's y if it does occur. And then I also have a forcing variable that may be the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, which is also a binary variable, um, which either says it's zero if no forcing is present, or it's one if forcing is present. And then classic analysis tells me I have to define my factual probability, saying what's the probability that the event happens given that the forcing is present. And I also define my P0 as the counterfactual, which says, well, if the forcing wasn't present, would the event not have happened? And classic analysis tells me, OK, I have my, my FAR value, which is 1 minus P0 over P1, which tells me the fraction of attributable risk, which is commonly used in climate science. OK, so that's all good and fine, as long as I only have two variables. But people have criticized this framework and said, well, what does it really mean if I have more than one variable? So in this case, we're kind of assuming there was x that causes y. But what if there's another variable z that also has an influence on y? How, how does the file relate to all this? Turns out, if you use Perl's causality network, you can define it very concisely. And that's just what Alexis did in his paper. So um, he basically, or they basically define causal necessity and causal sufficiency. So causal necessity means, and again, that's kind of loosely, x is a necessary ca cause of y if and only if x is required in order for y to happen, but other factors might also be required. Okay? So basically, if I don't have x, y doesn't happen. If I do have x, y might happen or y might not happen. That is my necessary cost condition, right? And so then Pn I can define as a probability that x is a necessary cause of y. Causal sufficiency is a much, much stronger condition. So x is a sufficient cause of y if and only if x always triggers y, but y may also occur for other reasons. So if you look at the CO2 forcing and the heat wave, it would say, well, if my CO2 forcing gets to a certain level, well, then um, I'm always going to have a heat wave winter and summer, which you can see how ridiculous that is for this example, so that probability would be very close to zero. So your PS probability that X is a sufficient cause of Y is always going to be much lower than your PN, right? It's, it's a much stronger condition. If I use that, I can then go ahead and say under certain assumption that Y is monotonic with respect to X, and if X is exogenous with respect to Y, I get some simplifications and I get these formulas, and if, in addition, P1 is bigger or equal to P0, then this one is always going to be bigger than 0, which means Pn is 1 minus P0 over P1, which, surprise, is our value of far, right? So we just got another interpretation that, in this case, far is actually the necessary causation probability, which now tells me concisely what far means. Furthermore, if we, this, this first condition is actually fairly easy to satisfy. This one is harder, and if this one isn't satisfied, these formulas are actually more complicated, but I will refer you to this. 
if you work in this area, I hope you pick that up and read the 12 pages and figure out which formula exactly to use in different cases. Um, actually, they define in this, in this paper PN, PS, and also PNS, and that then more fully characterizes the relationship between X and Y. So for questions, ask Alexis, please. All right. With that, I will move on to what's more my research area. So I'm switching gears here, and I'm going into observation analysis. We're done with intervention analysis from now on. We can't do interventions. We just do observation. What can we say then? So if you looked at classic statistics books up to the 1980s, many of them will just give you an answer. Well, correlation does, doesn't imply causation. I agree with that. I wasn't going to use correlation, but sure. Some say you can't say anything. Some say use Granger causality. That changed a little bit with uh, the advent of PERS called the calculus, but I will first walk you through Granger causality because I think there are some more things that are interesting to the community here, and then I will go to PERS causality. All right. So, Granger analysis for two variables, and this is the most common method in climate science, and I always like to start with the things that you guys already know. So, given two time series, x, t, and y, t, the question is, is x the Granger cause of y? And the classic method in climate science has developed two different autoregression models for y. The first one is, has y only regressed on former values of y. And the second one includes x and y. Right? So I develop these two models, I do my regression, and then I, at the end I perform a statistical test, and I ask, is model 2 significantly better than model 1? And if it is, let me say x Granger causes y because x is really important to know y in addition to knowing the former values of y. Okay? So Granger causality gain is based completely on predictability. All right. So quite often you have more than two variables, so what do you do then? It's actually relatively straightforward. You do vector autoregression. So in this case, you have different time series, yt1 to ytk, k different time series. And I don't know what's the cause of, and what's an effect, so I just toss them all in there, and I put them all in one vector, so all the time series are now in one vector, and I put them in here, and I develop a var of p model that expresses y in terms of its p legs. And then I'm going to have this nice model, I'm going to look at the different coefficients. So it's the standard least square approach to calculate the constant vector c and the matrices a, which are the regression parameters. So what do I do then? Well, I just have a simple example here, p equals 1, so I only use legs of order 1. Um, I'm just writing it out here. Here's my vector of the different time series that I'm interested in. Here are the different legged ones, leg of 1. And I can basically read here, well, this one is a linear combination of this times this and this times this and so forth. So I can basically read in my matrix which ones of these lagged variables are important to predict y for each one of them. So once I test its stability for my model, so I develop my regression, I find my parameters, I test that the system model is stable because otherwise it's meaningless. Once it's stable, I can go right ahead and I just look at my coefficients because they tell me exactly the amount of change in yt, uh, yti due to a change of yt minus 1j. Okay? Pretty straightforward. So if if that is non-zero, significantly non-zero, I'm saying this is the Granger cause of this. All right. And more generally, if I have p legs, I just have to look at whether any of the different legs for the ij parameter are significantly different from zero. And so I say this one Granger causes the other one. And the nice thing is that as a side effect, I actually get the coefficient also tells me the strength of the connection. In a linear sense, but nevertheless. All right. So that's pretty useful. Except one of the problems is, uh, and that's another trick I just wanted to teach everybody, one of the problems is most of my coefficients are actually going to be very close to zero, but not exactly zero. Which then raises the question, okay, what should I do? Should I just say, okay, whenever the magnitude of the coefficient is bigger than 0.01, I'd say there's a causal connection, otherwise there isn't. It doesn't quite feel right, and there is, in fact, a much better solution. So if you don't use standard regression, but you use regularized regression, so if you use LASSO, least absolute shrinkage and selection operator, basically when you solve your optimization problem to minimize your least square error, you in addition also minimize this 
or if you, if you work with this constraint at the same time, and if you do that, there's lots and lots of literature out there, it's a very standard problem, you get a regression, a set of regression coefficients where now most of the coefficients are actually exactly zero. They're being pushed to zero. If you want to read more on that, just type in Wikipedia. Lasso has an excellent explanation of why that is the case. Um, the remaining coefficients comp compensate for that change. And so now you have a model that's, not, that's more accurate and more robust because it basically reduces overfitting. And so then you can apply your Grange analysis because you don't have to add another threshold. You only have to choose this threshold over here, the parameter S, and you get clear variable selection. So for example, for Matthias's problem, this may be one first solution that he just runs lasso and looks at, okay, which ones are non-zero, and those variables should be in your conditioning set. Done. Again, if your key thing is predictability, then you're done. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, let's move on to observation analysis with Granger causality. So what causal calculus tells us, if you have an intervention analysis, you can actually prove causal connections. You can, you can ask, is there a causal connection between X and Y? You do appropriate interventions, assuming that your model is flexible enough. You can actually prove or disprove that there's a causal connection. It's a gold standard. Great. If you only have observations, you can't prove causal connections. And the main reason is that there can always be hidden common causes. And I'll go into that more in a few slides. But you can still disprove causal connections. And that's the key property we're going to use. So it's still powerful and it provides an upper bound on what what, con what cause causal relationships that can exist. So next, I will just walk you through a few key concepts of causal calculus. Uh, concept one, we already talked about this, the language for causal models is graphs. If you don't use graphs, it's very confusing. So always use graphs, think in graphs from now on. Um, my errors indicate this cause to effect, and if you don't know the direction, we don't give an error hat. So in this example here again, X is the cause of Y, and Y is the cause of Z. You should have a question here. Isn't X also a cause of Z? Hmm? Well, I haven't been concise enough because we're cause talking about direct causes. What do we mean by direct causes? Well, in this case, X is the direct of cause of Y, and Y is the direct cause of Z, and X is only indirect cause of Z. And the way I can figure that out is simply, if I know Y, does X tell me anything new about Z? So if I want to know z, and I only know y, if x doesn't give me any information beyond what I know from y to predict z, then there is no direct connection over here. Which, by the way, is exactly what I'm going to test for in a second. So keep that kind of triangle plot in mind, because that's what we're going to use. So the goal of cause analysis is to identify only direct connections and get rid of all the other ones. Um, be warned, directness is a relative concept. It's related to what nodes you include in your graph. And that's another one that causes a lot of confusion and why these graphs are really helpful. So here's a little toy example. Say I live in a monsoon area. If there's a monsoon month, it's much more likely that there's flooding. So this is a direct cause of this, all right? But if I put rain in this intermediate variable, well, if there's a monsoon month, it's more likely to rain, which means it's more likely to be, for it to be flooding. If I know how much rain there is, I can tell how much flooding there's going to be. I don't care whether it's monsoon months or not. If I know this, I don't, I don't need to know this anymore, right? So we've just made what was a direct course an indirect one just by including intermediate variable. So variable selection is really important when you interpret your results. All right? Uh, causality is a probabilistic relationship. We already talked about the probability tables before. But again, in this case, flooding is more likely in monsoon months, but it isn't certain. Right? And vice versa, I can also have flooding outside of monsoon months. Um, however, for our applications right now, we really don't care about the probability tables. I'm not going to deal with those. All I want is the underlying graph for now. So number four, and that's a very important one, hidden common causes. So let's say... I have a very simple model. Cloud cover influences how much UV there is, radiation on the surface. It also influences the chance of rain. If I collect data for all these three variables and I run that through my, through my tool, I'm likely to get a model like this, right? If, however, for some reason, I didn't rec record whether there's cloud cover or not, and I only have those two variables, what am I going to get? 
well, if I only have the observations, I'm going to get something that either says this is the cause of this or this is the cause of this, which it really isn't. It's a hidden common cause that connects those two variables. So this isn't really true causal connections. So that's the problem observation analysis. So what can I do? The key thing is to always be aware of whatever result you get in terms of potential causal connections. Those are only potential connections. At the end, I always have to realize what I'm getting from my analysis is only potential cause-effect relationships. And so I always have to test at the end whether they're... So at the end, I can uh, never prove a causal connection, but I can disprove causal connection. So uh, I'm actually going to talk about how we deal with that in the next slide, I think, actually a little bit further. So um, here's a very basic algorithm to find independence graphs, a coin to pearl. And the basic idea is if x is a direct of cause of y or y is a direct cause of x, then x and y are conditionally dependent given all other subsets of variables in my graph. Uh, and that's a necessary condition. All right? So basically, if x has, is the direct causal effect of y or y is the direct causal effect of x, I can never get conditional independence no matter what kind of other subsets I condition on. Does that make sense? Because they really can't separate the two. So if that's a necessary condition, I can look at when that condition is, is not satisfied, when it's violated. So if you can find any subset S of the other variables for which X is conditionally independent of Y, I know that X and Y cannot have a direct cause between them, and I can eliminate that edge. So my basic algorithm goes like this. I start with a fully connected graph, which basically says everything, every node X is the cause of every other node Y. So it's a very busy graph. And then I do the pruning using this condition up here. I just look for any pairs of nodes where this necessary condition for causality is violated, and I delete that edge. So I always look for subsets of the other variables for which x and y become independent, simple statistical test, and if I can find such a subset, I get rid of that edge and say there cannot be a causal connection, a direct one between those two nodes, right? So sample tests, well, if I know my distributions are Gaussian and I have continuous variables, I can simply use partial correlation and Fisher's D test for the condition independence tests. Um, if I don't know anything and I think maybe my distribution is exponential and uh, I don't even know what it is, I may be say, it may be safer to discretize and where well, we discretize and use conditional mutual information, which comes from information theory. All right. And then finally, I usually establish my error directions. So these are time series just from. Uh, from temporal constraints. So again, keep in mind, this is an el elimination procedure. So what you get at the end are only uh, potential cause-effect relationships. They're not proven, they're just potential ones. But I know anything that's outside of there is not a causal relationship. Um, so there are a bunch of conditions in order to make sure that we do the math properly. So to get from the data probability distribution to the independence graph, there are some conditions here. They're mostly satisfied, even if they're not satisfied, it's usually okay. The big one is this one, going from the independence graph to an actual causal interpretation. So the assumption there is that there are no hidden common courses. So whenever I have nodes X and Y in the graph, if they have a common cause Z, Z also must be included in my analysis. Is that usually going to be true in geoscience? I want you all to shake your head and say, no, this is not, not happening. So there are usually many hidden common courses because quite often we're not aware of them, they cannot be measured, or including the model would make the model way too complex. So in geoscience, there's almost always going to be hidden common courses, which again means that each hypothesis could be direct connection due to a hidden common course or a combination of both of the set that I get at the end. So how do I deal with that? Basically, I say in the results, every link that I get must be checked by domain expert. If we can find a physical mechanism that explains it, that's great. If not, it's a new hypothesis. So the place for this to, is to either use it for prediction, just like range of causality, or to use it for hypothesis generation. You cannot prove causal relationships from observation, but you can find the subset of hypotheses that are still very useful. So that's, that's how I see the places for 
either for prediction tasks or to narrow down the number of possibilities for hypothesis generation. Um, I'm going to skip over this one in the interest of time. I'm just going to talk briefly about sample vacations. How much time do I have left? Five minutes. Okay. So um, they're going to be, if you do an observation analysis, there are mainly two types of applications. One is where you have global or compound indices which are not spatially distributed. And usually in the past, I've usually seen those with like two to 100 variables. You can have a few hundred. Then there are spatially distributed ones where you have variables representing, say, values of an atmospheric field at different locations around the globe, and those can be huge. I've dealt with data sets where you have the atmosphere is a 3D place, so you have four different layers, say, and then you have thousands of grid points. So pretty quickly you get up to 10,000 or even 100,000 nodes. You want to have a temporal model, so you have to have that many like copies, so you can easily reach 100,000. And that's about as far as we can handle computationally so far. Um, so most commonly data is provided as time series. You can also deal with static data, and it's usually best to develop temporal models if you have uh, temporal data. So just a little small application that I've been doing recently, and here I took the, uh, it was fun to do both models. So you have on the left side a very simple Granger model, and on the right side a very simple Perl model. Um, so the question we're asking here is, what is the effect of Arctic temperature on speed of the jet stream and vice versa? Um, and so we compare those two frameworks again. These are very simple linear models. Both of these frameworks allow for nonlinear models, but here just a linear model. And the results are very similar, and that's actually reassuring. I have two very different frameworks, and for this case, they give me two very similar results. So what I see, basically, the way to read this is, so I have Arctic temperature here, which has strong correlation. My time step size is five days, so I can look only at connections for five days apart. So for example, here for five days, the coefficient is 0.74 for autocorrelation, which is very strong. 10 days is weaker and it's actually negative. Uh, 15 days is much, much weaker. And then 20, 50, 25 days doesn't really do much. Same result I get here. It says 5, 10, and 15 days for this loop. And here I get strengths. Here I don't in this, in this framework. Um, same here. Strong autocorrelation at first. And you get 5, 15, and 20 are important. And in fact, this also says 5, 15, 20 are important because everything in parentheses means I only got a very big connection. Then, of course, more interestingly, I have a connection from Arctic temperature to jet stream, which is strongest for five days, a little bit less for 15, and almost nothing for 20 and 25. In the other direction, I have very little at the beginning. I actually have a stronger one at 15 days, very little again at 20 and at 25. And you get very similar results in this framework. So for this kind of data set, both of them do a very similar job. Um, and this one, I think Dart, who's giving a talk later, is going to talk a little bit about this. But basically, we're just trying, we're taking the output from a climate model and try to do some reverse engineering. We just take global averages here, and we try to find the causal signature in this data between those different variables. And you can do, for example, something like compare, if I do compression, and if I compress my data first and uncompress it, has my causal signature changed? And it turns out it changes very little, which is great. But if I look at different members of the ensemble, interestingly enough, I get a core structure that's the same, but some of the connections are different, which is making us think that maybe some initial conditions bring out some dynamic conditions, relationships more strongly than others, something we're still looking at. Um, another example is if you have a spatially distributed system and you want to track, say, interactions around the globe, you can try to find interaction pathways around the globe from data. So uh, in this case, though, you have to be very careful because you have to deal with spatial autocorrelation that causes problems if you have a non-uniform grid. We started out with a grid that wasn't quite as bad as this. We started with an equal area grid, which still isn't uniform. And it gave us a horrible bias. We basically only found relationships wherever the grid points are close to each other and not where they weren't close to each other, which really wasn't what we wanted. So we instead looked for the maximally uniform grid, and we found that to be facated points, which based on a paper from 2007, you can calculate like this. This is actually not a perfect grid. You will see most of those are hexagons. There are a few that have seven edges, seven corners, and some that only have five. But it is the 
it's a numerical approximation, but it's the most, most maximally uniform grid that you can find. And if you use that, you can then start to say, throw geopotential height in there, daily geopotential height data, and ask the network, where are interactions? And so from that data, we found those interactions that you see here. So this is for zero days, this is for one day travel time, how far does my signal travel in one day? And if you look at that carefully, you see these are actually storm tracks, what you find. So you find these kind of signatures in there. And of course, what you find in terms of signatures totally depends on the data you put in. And so, for example, this actually represents diffusion, which is very strong along the equator, and these are advection mechanisms. Um, I will skip over this. We can also do it in 3D. Um, testing is very important. I mean, we have a new framework. We have to figure out how well it works. So I put together a little advection diffusion simulation in a 20 by 20 grid with uh, periodic boundary conditions. So whatever goes out here comes back here. We can feed in, for example, an original advection field that goes like this. I run my simulation, I put the data in my file, I read it into my algorithm, I don't even know which variable corresponds to what, and I read it and I find these interactions in here, which is actually kind of interesting. This, this, the algorithm has a hard time with dealing with diagonal edges, that's why it gets so boxy. So I have a grid bias here, but overall, it finds the interactions from the data without knowing anything about where the data came from. So that's pretty neat. I can do the same thing with different ones. Again, here you have a cross current from here to there and from here to there. And again, it has many problems with the diagonal edges, but it gets the overall picture correct. So um, we can also do the whole thing in spectral space, but I don't have time for this. So let's just say, uh, let's just finish up with some limitations and challenges of causal discovery. You need, the biggest one for me is always you need large sample size because we use lots of statistical tests, they're not robust if you don't have enough samples. I love to have at least a few thousand samples. Okay, and Doug is telling me I should move on. So, uh, computational complexity, we usually model as thing as station A. Uh, um, let me just skip through. Okay, conclusions. Think in terms of graphs, all of you, no matter what kind of modeling you do, please think in terms of graphs. It really helps for conceptualizing. And those people I got on board, it's actually very intuitive for geoscientists. You are so visually oriented anyway, so graphs really come very natural. If you work with intervention analysis, please look up Hanna's paper. For observation analysis, weaker conditions are, are only possible but still powerful. Future work, we want to determine which observational methods work best in practice, practice for specific geoscience applications, where we take into account the sample size, the distributions, the nonlinearities, robustness, sensitivity, computational speed, simplicity of the model, and how familiar climate scientists are with the underlying methods so that we can really explain it well. Um, Matthias, keep using graphs, please. Noel, go back to graphical models, pick up that work, and bring it back, and be our leading example of how to use it. And that's it. Oh, yeah. And there's a climate science workshop next month. You're all invited to come. Uh, even if you didn't submit anything, it's great to just go and participate. And Doug is the host, and David is running a hackathon event, and Slava, who's here, is one of the chairs. And with that, um, Chris, who knows who these people are? <laughs> okay. Right.